We're going to talk about the regenerative farming um, panel, and I'd like to just do a nice um, quick intro for our, our panelists. Uh, Katie Baker, Fair Idaho, um, if you want to come on up. Um, they've been, Fair has been a, a relatively new nonprofit, uh, but I feel like their impact of just connecting restaurants, agricultural producers, um, supply chains, has been so significant, even though like they're you know going through their growing pains like everybody else. Um, they, the, the work that Katie and her team is doing is awesome. And then uh, Kristen Richards, uh, FB Sciences, she flew from North Carolina, Virginia. Virginia, to be out here. And FB Sciences is really a, um, a biostimulants company that is working with soil amendments to really raise that quality of our soil health as well. And then, I don't think this, uh, our other panelist needs uh, much ado, but Mr. Jim Zamzow um, is here. And uh, I've, one of the things that I, I'd, yeah, come on up, Jim. One of the things uh, I was talking to, I think it was, was it Nick? You no, know, uh, um, one of my friends uh, earlier this week, and they're like, Jim Zamzow's gonna be there? I feel like Jim's like my uncle. I've, <laughs> I've heard him for 30 years on the radio, and you know I need to go meet this guy. And so, really, the, the conversation what we're gonna we're gonna try to make it really informal, you know. But how does Idaho transition or even get these conversations started without having the politics involved with it? Because it's it is very difficult. I mean, even when we're talking about going, even regenerative ag is a charged word or sustainability energy transitions. And if we can't have honest, candid conversations, you know, where we can, we can well, well state a problem, we can't work on the solutions very well. And so that's one of the things that I'm really focused on is like, hey, let's just have honest conversations. And if they're, they're emotionally charged or they're painful, that's not our fault. Like the truth should not be painful or political at this point. Like we're in 2022 and we have all the technology we need to solve our problems. We just need to have the human um, agreement that finding that common ground of, of allowing the or empowering the youth to get to work. It's like, hey, we need you guys to solve some of these problems with us. And so that's, uh, I'm going to kind of lead it by saying, um, you know, what, what would be, I, I would like to start with Jim, you know, because you're, you're really um, at the forefront of the, the farming, gardening, you know, kind of the, the, the local front of how do your consumers, you know, feel about sustainable ag or climate smart ag or regenerative ag? Is there a demand? Do you see a demand for these things coming? Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, where do you think Idaho's going? Well, you know, we're going to go that way or we're going to die, one of the two. That's uh, <laughs> so my wife said, now, be careful, don't hog the mic. So you feel free to grab it whenever you want to. But I'll have to you tell you this, this story. <clears throat> I, was, I was educated conventionally. I learned all about chemical fertilizers and pesticides and University of Idaho plant protection. Uh, I became a professional soil turf manager. Flew back to Marysville, Ohio became a Scots lawn expert. And this was in my 20s. I had uh, quite a, a business built using chemical lawn products. And after about the third year of doing full programs, I had a customer come in and he said, would you come over to my house and look at, at my lawn? And I said, well, you know, it's Saturday morning, I, I don't have time. He said, please, just for a few minutes. So I went over, looked at his lawn, diagnosed every problem that I had been educated with, every disease, insects I'd never seen before. And I said, well, you, you need to use crabgrass preventer and Scott's Turf Builder, and you need to use Scott's Turf Builder and insecticide, and you need to use Scott's Plus 2 weed killer plus fertilizer. And he said, I've done all that. I've done all that for three years. 
why do I have these problems? And I said, well, you know, the bugs, they crawl over, and the, and the fungus spores, they fly in. He said, I'm not buying it, Jim. He said, I've done everything you've ever told me, and my lawn's getting worse. I said, how do you know? And he said, look at my neighbor. He comes in every fall. He puts on about a half an inch of just simply dry manure. It stinks for about three days, and then his lawn is better than mine is. Why? I said, um, I'll get back to you. <laughs> then my accountant called me up, and he said, Jim, I want you to meet a man. He just, he just retired here from the Midwest, and I think you'd like to know what he has to say. His name was C.J. Finzow. He was the co-founder of Acres USA, for those of you that know what that is, out of Kansas City originally, which was the first eco-ag company that, that we've had in modern history, if you will, go back to the way things used to be. He agreed to have coffee with me, and I went and sat down with him for a few minutes, and I told him what my dilemma was. And he said, your problem's carbon. I said, well, I don't understand. He said, don't you know that the microbes in the soil will always maintain a carbon to nitrogen balance? You start off in this soil out here with about a 3% organic matter. You put on a pound of nitrogen, the microbes will digest 12 to 20 pounds of carbon for every unit of nitrogen that you put on your soil. At the end of three years, you're down to a one half percent of carbon in your soil. You no longer have any humus. Your soil turns white. You no longer have the darkness. You no longer have the microbial activity in the soil. The microbes feed on carbon. A byproduct of, of their digestion is what we call in science a mucilaginous substance. I used to call it snot. <laughs> that has the ability to hold and maintain water, even in the case of a drought. And I'm, the light's starting to go on for me. And believe it or not, the restaurant had to run us out that night. I spent five years with him. He completely changed my life from being one of, of a big fertilizer chemical kind of a guy to what I am now, which is somewhere in between. As a product of the 60s, I became totally organic, did only organics. And I realized that we cannot make these quick transitions from a chemically addicted soil to a full organic program without losing our crop. It's like uh, taking someone that's, a, that's addicted to drugs and pulling immediately off of the drugs to go to a drug-free environment. Many times they just die. They can't, they can't suffer the pain that it takes to make that transfer. And when we do that to our soil, we lose our crops. How many of you in here, or how many of you know a farmer that can, besides Gabe, Afford to lose your yield, your profitability for four years in a row. For those of you that even own your own ground. Not, not in today's age. No. You know, definitely not. No. So that's my introduction. I'm going to stop well, because well, I, I think that's a really good segue for Kristen here. You know, so biostimulants, maybe you want to tell them a little bit of a, uh, an explanation of what that is and how it's a transitionary you know, kind of a product. Absolutely. Um, so I work for FB Sciences. Our core technologies are biostimulants and biopesticides, uh, but we primarily focus on biostimulants. And a biostimulant, as I was talking to some people in the audience this morning, is not defined by what it is, but by what it does. So a plant biostimulant is um, a substance or a microbe 
that will elicitate, uh, elicit a specific desired plant response, such as a quality trait, nutrient use efficiency, um, nutrient enhancement of uptake, and um, you can also get improvement in the soil rhizosphere. And this is irregardless of its fertilizer content, so it's separate from the nutritional value of that product. So we make a, a variety of, of biostimulants, but there's a number out there. You might have heard of seaweed extracts or humic acid. Um, amino acids are also considered uh, biostimulants, and it's been our mission to help bring tools to growers that will allow them um, to produce more efficiently with less fertilizer or increase your yield with the same amount of fertilizer. So, for instance, we have a climate uh, report. Marion, the audience is uh, in charge of all of our, our climate relations, but we just released our climate impact report and we show that if you apply our technology um, in tandem with fertilizers, you can reduce your emissions by 37%. We've shown that our technology, the biostimulant technology, and this is applicable to many biostimulants, you can reduce your nitrogen inputs by 10 to 20%. So it's offering solutions for a way to transition from those, uh, those soils that are so dependent on fertilizers and chemical inputs, and you can still maintain yield um, and still maintain plant health. We are working to do more studies with our technology specifically to look at how it's enhancing the soil microbe, um, the biome, the soil biome, because um, we know that our technology, when we apply it, we can see an increase in 14% increase in root exudates. So that's feeding that soil microbiome. Um, so we're just offering uh, a solution that I think would help transition that for growers in a very sustainable option. And then I would, I'd like to ask, you know, Katie, you know, how, how, do, how are the producers, the restaurants, um, the kind of the supply chains feeling about, you know, the rising input costs, um, what's the sentiment or the morale out there, and how, do, how are they feeling about sustainable egg or regenerative egg, and are there concerns that they may not know enough to make a transition? Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for that. Um, so just to give you some quick background about our organization, uh, FAIR Idaho, FAIR stands for Food, Agriculture, Restaurants, and Establishments. We were formed out of the pandemic. Um, it was a response um, to really a lot of business owners not sure how they were going to operate um, through a pandemic if they were going to lose their businesses. So our organization formed to really represent the Idaho food system. We represent farmers, ranchers, um, food and beverage producers, independent restaurants, bars, and retailers. Um, we did this, we, we structured our organization very uniquely. I don't know if there's any other organization out there structured like ours, but we did want to advocate on behalf of our members. Um, and so we will be, we look at a lot of issues that maybe our farmers are facing or our restaurants and bars right now and really advocate on behalf of those businesses. And then um, really connect. So connect Idaho producers with Idaho retailers to um, strengthen the business model of our farmers. It's kind of our secret mission is like, how do we help farmers? And that's really giving them an opportunity to be financially successful and um, allowing them a shorter, you know, to address the issues with that we're currently facing. So we went through the pandemic um, for farmers. A lot of the farmers involved with FAIR, um, you know, it was, I think that they, we have issues with um, ordering and distribution, as I talked with Bob Howard from Desert Mountain. He always reminds me, don't forget about distribution. But um, so we have the pandemic, right? Um, and then we have the pandemic aftershocks. Um, so there's increased cost of labor, um, labor shortages affecting every sector we represent, um, supply chain disruptions, um, and also the increased cost of food. So for our organization, um, to be really honest with you, 
we, um, I get asked a lot, like, okay, we're kind of coming out of the pandemic, you know, we're all like this, barely taking off our masks, but we still have all these other issues that are really plaguing um, every sector that we represent, and also a collective exhaustion, um, which I've had two meetings last week where, you know, it was almost like we left in tears kind of thing, because that seems to um, really be hitting people hard right now. So we have, you know, people want to purchase farmland. Obviously, we have a lot of development pressures here. Um, and so FAIR looks at that and says, like, we need to help far our Idaho farmers and ranchers really connect with those retailers so that they want to pass down that farm to future generations, so they don't want to sell their property to a developer, um, that they don't feel the financial strain um, that has really plagued uh, farmers in the, you know, for decades. And so the other thing I really love about our organization is we include all stakeholders. So very much to your point, Jason, it's not left or right, it's forward. And we take that really seriously. But the only way we think that you're going to make positive change is by meeting in the Radical Food Center um, to create positive change within the industry. And those are really sometimes hard conversations but we have to open our doors to everyone because there's commonalities between us all. And I think that's the only way we're going to get through this collective exhaustion is together. But then when you sit down and meet folks in the middle, then you have an opportunity for ranchers like Gabe to talk to somebody that's really struggling because of the increased cost of inputs for farmers that are using conventional ag and then say, look, I'm profitable. Like maybe they just care about, you know, making a living wage. Maybe they just, you know, are open. It, this is the time I think is now, especially with the increased cost of, of goods, is really to help those farmers see that there is a different way and have it that way be approachable. So thanks. And I would say if, there, if there's anybody that can talk a farmer rancher off a ledge, it'd be Gabe. I think what Katie just said there was a, the perfect example of coming together and finding common ground for common good. I mean, that, that right there is an example of building community. And I think that's the challenge before us is how do we bring everyone together? Because what's good for the farmer and rancher, increased profitability, is also good in the long run for the community. It's good for the supply chain. These regenerative practices are going to build the resilience because of some of the things we're seeing, these wide fluctuations in, in weather patterns. And obviously, it's good for human health, too. So it's a perfect example, common ground for common good. And, and so uh, oftentimes, people, you know, when they're thinking of regenerative agriculture and they've been doing something a certain way for a long time, where do they start? You know, like, that's, yep. that's a big question that I just, when I just ask randomly. Yeah, you know. and a great question, Jason. And I often get asked this, well, Gabe, if this is so good, why isn't everybody doing it? You know, I have a couple college degrees. Never, ever, not once in my classes did they talk to me about the carbon-nitrogen ratio in the soil. Okay, they didn't talk to me about the biological components, what really drives the nutrient cycle, protozoan, nematodes, eating bacteria, they didn't teach that. So farmers and ranchers don't know what they don't know. So where to start every time? It has to start with education. You know, I, I consult on a lot of farms and ranches, and every one I walk on, those who are my clients know, I can be pretty blunt. And I often hear nothing but excuses. Well, you don't understand. It's too cold. It's too wet. It's too hot. It's too dry. I've got sand. I've got clay. And I told him, I said, you're right. I know what your problem is. And they said, what? I said, tonight, you walk into that house, go into the bathroom, and look in the mirror. There's your problem. Staring right back at you. Because it's our mindset. The greatest compaction on most farms and ranches is right between the ears. You know, you need to realize that it's up to you. One of the real changing things in my life occurred in 1997. I just finished my third year of crop failures. And I went and listened to Don Campbell, a rancher from Alberta, Canada, was in Bismarck speaking. 
And he made this statement. He said, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And driving back from that conference late that evening, I just knew it was up to me. And so as a farmer and rancher, we have to quit making excuses, and we have to educate ourselves, and then we have to align with the tools that'll help move us forward. Yes, thank you, thank you for that, Gabe. Um, I, I guess maybe we'll, we'll r run it back down, but like for Katie, um, like what are you seeing where the, the biggest needs are for, you know, let's say the farmers and ranchers in, is it, is it uh, a workforce side? Is it more capital? You know, because as all these inputs going up, um, obviously their anxiety is probably pretty high, right? Like, so where would, where would we start in helping? Let's say I'm, I'm not actually a farmer or rancher. I don't have my own land, but I support s several. And so how do I help those, those people? Or what are you hearing from those guys on how you can help them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, we have 300 members across the state, um, so it really ranges the gamut. We get good perspective from across the state from just our membership base. But, um, you know, on every single phone call, I talk to a farmer, they're concerned about water. Water's the big issue right now. Um, we represent only independent food and beverage businesses. So for us, a lot of our farmers are small to mid-size. Um, not, that's, that's who we represent. So that's um, who we want to help as an organization. But I think there is, you know, for our organization, I'm writing a grant this week um, for an online ordering platform because really if, uh, there's, um, I'll tell you, with the supply chain disruptions, the good thing that's come out of it is that uh, retailers want to source more local product, but they want it now. So um, how do we help them do that? The ordering system is totally archaic. When a restaurant wants to source from a local producer, it's phone calls, texts, emails with their fresh sheet. So it's just not a working system. So we're looking at like how can we alleviate some of those smaller issues within the framework of our organization. Um, you know, when I talk to um, Bob Howard with Desert Mountain, it's distribution. That's another thing. So we don't have that distribution in place to really get the product there. Um, right now, we're currently, a lot of our farmers self-distribute um, and do sell to wholesale accounts. Um, so that's something, too, that we can be looking at. But it's really like, again, strengthening the business model of our farmers, those small to mid-size, to really help them ramp up their business. And if you think about, like, you know, I've talked with David with American Farmland Trust about this, but um, our secret mission is, like, how do you really protect farmland and farmers? It's really strengthening their business model. Um, but uh, for us within our organization, um, a lot of our farmers and ranchers do practice regenerative practices. And so, um, but we also want to open the door to people that are open to hearing from our farmers and really just allowing those uh, safe space for those conversations to take place. Because, you know, again, you go look at water and how can we help? It's like connecting farmers together so that they can learn that there's other practices out there that might be, make their business more successful. And I think that's a really great point is the storytelling aspect. Because um, I've talked to a lot of uh, farmers and ranchers, and uh, some are, you know, maybe they're a little hopeless at times. Maybe there's, there's a week where they feel a little despair. And I found that oftentimes, if they're not talking to their colleagues or the people in the space about, you know, the, the similar challenges or, or the resonance, you know, that, that, they're, that they're going through, the trials and tribulations that they're going through, if they're not talking to them, the problems are much worse. But if they realize that other farmers and ranchers are experiencing the same things, it's a lot easier for them to process and, and work towards. And that information sharing, I think, is, is one of the, the most important aspects or one of the most valuable aspects I see to regenerative ag is that it's a social type of platform. It's a sharing, you know, it's a collaboration, cooperation, and, and communication as opposed to the traditional model, which is your neighbor, has, you and him have trade secrets now. It's like, well, I don't know what, I don't want to, I can't ask him what his cover crops or his, his interest eating is because he thinks that we're in direct competition with each other. You know, so I think that's one of the really cool things about regenerative ag. And so, Kristen, I'd, I'd like to ask you, being in Virginia um, and kind of in the, the transitionary, 
you know, kind of uh, in a spot between the, the multinationals and, and the farmers on the ground. How is that sentiment, how, how do you feel, is there a pushback when, you know, you guys are talking about whether it's sustainable ag or climate smart, you know, that's, it's, labeling is very important. I would say it's very dependent on who you're speaking to because um, certainly uh, I've been pleasantly surprised by a lot of very, very large corporations are very open and want to be uh, to make those steps towards sustainability. Um, that's why they've come to us is they see that this is a, a, a relatively light lift for them to start on that path. Um, but it, it's, it's really dependent on who you're speaking to. Um, some people are, are very entrenched in what they know for the reasons we just talked about, education is key. Um, and so the more we can get out there and have it uh, being driven from the consumer level, the more it, it's going to be successful to have it from top down and bottom up. Um, so I, I've seen mixed results, but I've been very pleasantly surprised by major corporations. Um, you know, we had Yara come to us to help um, increase some of their sustainability. And so we did a, a small program with them. Uh, and so we're seeing more and more traction in that regard. I'd say, in, in just to follow up to that, in the research and development side, like where do you see sustainability moving? This might be a broad question, but sustainability moving in the, the soil health or you know, the biostimulants sector, how, how big of a role does that play in their sustainability mix? I think it, it's not a question of how big, because just as he mentioned earlier, it's a question of when, because this is ultimately going to have to happen to maintain a, a sustainable food supply and arable land that we can continue the farm. We're depleting our soils in, in, in a way that we cannot sustain. Um, so it, it will have to happen. Um, and who is driving that change? I, I'm not the right person to say. Um, but I do feel that more and more biologicals and biostimulants in particular are getting traction because it is an easy opportunity to incorporate in conventional and organic farming um, and help lead towards a more uh, regenerative model. Now, it, it, some people are never going to choose to go all the way to a regenerative model, but if we can push um, major corporations to get more in line with that, that will make a huge impact. Um, so it, it's, it's a spectrum. All right, thank you. And, and I'd like to ask Jim another question here. So as a guy who's been in the trenches for a long time, you know, to, you know practicing, learning, and, and really the boots on the ground, if you will, of, of gardening and, and farming, especially for you know, the individual, the residential person, and even probably, I'm, I'm sure, plenty of commercial. Um, where do you see Regen Ag or Sustainable Ag heading in Idaho? And what are some of the pain points that we have to overcome? Well, it's a pretty complex situation. Uh, we want to keep politics out of it the best we can, but it's very difficult to do that when big ag is being sustained by big pharma. Uh, when I've, I've struggled this my, my whole life. Since I was your age, I was, I was being abused because I was a foo-foo powder salesman. Uh, or oh, you've got another one of those foo-foo powders. Uh, or I've heard that, you know, if you'll fall for what Zamzo's telling you, I've got some beachfront property over in Caldwell I'd like to sell you. Uh, be prepared to be abused because you gotta follow the money. It's, and sometimes it's a very difficult thing for a person to make the transition because, especially with big ag, they don't know where to start. The bank won't loan money for foo-foo powder. They only loan money for nitrogen fertilizers and for uh, Roundup and for chemical things. And people are so fearful of turning loose of what they've been doing. When Chernobyl melted down, I went up to North Idaho to try to convince a lot of our producers up there to start raising some of the herbs that were being raised in Eastern Europe 
that were being destroyed basically by radiation. And what I got was my grandpa raised peas and wheat. My daddy raised peas and wheat. And peas and wheat's good enough for me. I couldn't get them to raise lavender. I couldn't get them to raise chickpeas. I couldn't get them to, to diversify their crops whatsoever. I got some Australians to do it. So we have this challenge of how do we get started? And we in southern Idaho are in, in the biggest mess, if you will. We've got a land-grant university that's in the Palouse. The Palouse has 30 foot of alluvial soil, just like they do in Iowa. Kuna, Idaho doesn't have that luxury. And what we used to have, my zoology professor in college said, do you guys realize that all of this area out south in the desert at one time was tall bunch grass? He says it's now sagebrush, yellow star thistle, cheat grass, foxtail. He said, do you know why? Well, when the U.S. Army decided that this was the place they were going to raise their horses, and when they started grazing cattle and sheep, they grazed this clear to oblivion. We get nine inches of rain out here in the desert. The professors at the University of Idaho didn't know how to deal with a 8.2 pH high calcareous soil. You know where I got my help? University of Nevada, Reno. They know about the desert. And we started learning, oh my gosh, we have such a high buffer pH in this soil, we can't get enough acid in our soil to turn our trace minerals loose. And we don't have enough water and rainfall to get it done. I started an acronym years ago, coincidentally, it's LAWN, Light Air Water Nutrients. If you want to grow any type of a plant anywhere, you've got to fit the parameters that that plant needs in the world. Light, is it enough or too much? Air, above and below ground? Water, adequate but not too much? And nutrients, light air, water, nutrients. If you do your evaluation, you'll figure out if you're having problems with a crop, you're, you're missing one of those elements in your soil. Now, the way we always look at the last one is assuming that we have enough light, air, and water, which is beginning, beginning to be kind of a problem, we look at nutrients. Well, I, I've talked to an awful lot of guys in the ag industry that think that 500 units of nitrogen is a good level to grow a crop of corn. When I was working with Maui pineapple and growing their pineapples, they thought, that's a 20-month crop, they thought 500 units of nitrogen was ideal. And they couldn't figure out why they've got red tide in their bay, because all their nitrogen would go right through that lava rock from Haleakala down right into the, to the ocean and grow the microbes that caused skin rash so that the surfers couldn't, couldn't swim. It was because Maui pineapple was putting thousands of tons of, of chemical fertilizer on their pineapple crop. And the reason I even called them on, on them, sorry, I get off track here a little bit. The reason I even called on them in the first place is when I first went to Maui, I bought a pineapple, took it back to the condominium, cut it open, and took a bite of it, and it bit me back. It was so acid, it was terrible. So I, I found out who the ag guys were, and I said, you guys, you're, you're, you're mineral deficient. You guys have depleted all your soils. I did soil analysis, and uh, basically they were growing everything hydroponically. Water, chemical fertilizer, because it was just like growing it into sand. We did tremendous things over there. They forgot to tell me that they were 
they were on a three-year decline. They were going to quit growing pineapple in three years. Had they told me that, I probably would, <laughs> wouldn't have done the work for them. But the guy that was head of their agricultural uh, portion came to me one time and he said, well, you know, you know, with all the trials that we did, you know what we learned, the most important thing? And I said, not sure what. He said, we can grow just as good a crop with half the nitrogen as we, as we were growing with 500 units of nitrogen. And then we have to get, start getting into to cover cropping and crimping and, and uh, biological diversity of our plants and all of these things that, that is so, so critical. But back to your question, I think was how do we get started in this thing? Sometimes, like a car that's got a bad battery, we used to be able to push them and get them started. Can't do that anymore, I guess, now. But sometimes we have to do some things to get the program kick-started. We can start barefooted, and we can go out there and we can plant a rye cover crop, or we can plant a, an alfalfa cover crop, and then that's dependent on tilling that in the ground and then getting started next year. Sometimes we need to use some pumps. Sometimes we need to get some compost. I had, I'll tell you one story and then I'll pass the mic. So back when I was in my 20s, I was managing our CUNA store, which was a one-man store at the time. We ground some grain and we, we sold some livestock supplies. Uh, Dwayne Yamamoto was the mayor at the time, but he was also from a third-generation Japanese farm. Very good farmers. They had a few Holstein calves, and he would come in and get some calf feed. One day he said, Jim, I'm going to open up a section of ground out here in Cuna, out in the desert. For those of you who don't know, a section of ground is 640 acres. I said, Dwayne. Boy, you got your work cut out for you, because there's no organic in that soil. I knew everything there was to know. Actually, I was 25 years old, and don't you know it all when you're 25? <laughs> what I, the programs that I had been doing up to that point in time were 1,000 square feet. And I tried to apply what I knew about a 1,000 square feet garden to 640 acres. Well, he already had my number, but he played with me a little bit. He, I said, well, he said, what do you think, Jim? And I said, I think you need to put on about 20 ton of good compost per acre on that ground. He said, ah, oh, that's a great idea. But he said, I'm real busy. So would you figure out where I can get enough compost to go on 640 acres at 20 ton to the acre? And he said, if you can figure out how I can transport it out there and spread it, and you can do it for what Jack Simplot can sell me his fertilizer for. He said, you've got a deal. I thought, aha. So I called the two big feedlock op operators here, uh, Jimmy Warren and Rich Hormachia. I said, what do you think uh, about me getting some of your compost? They said, we don't have any compost. We've got raw manure. I said, well, what do you think about me getting that? And they said, you can have it. In fact, if you'll bring your trucks, we'll get the Michigan loader out there, and we'll load it for you for free. Haul it out of here. I thought, good. Well, you know what? 640 acres at 20 ton, figure that out. That's a lot of manure. <laughs> and haul it, haul it 20 miles out to behind uh, CUNA and see what your delivery costs are. And then hire the guy with the manure spreader and put it on 640 acres, and you find out you got your hands full. Boy, it was a good homework assignment. And he came in a while later, and he said, what would you find out? I said, well, I think you kind of know. And he said, I know. But he said, let me tell you something, Jim. If you can ever figure out a way to get that soil going, like that compost would, you can make it easy enough for us to apply and affordable enough for us to afford 
you'll have the secret to agriculture. I never forgot that. I started researching and I started stirring humic acid and urea in an old black barrel with a canoe or out in the back of my store. And I made more concoctions that you can possibly imagine, trying to figure out how I could make something that was a biological stimulant, stimulant still had nutrients in it, but could still get the soil diversity back to life again. And then one day I had a serendipitous discovery. And I thought, wow, this thing kind of went together in the, right, in the right steps. We formed a homogenous mixture of nutrients that the University of Utah said with a micrograph, they could go down with an electron microscope and a microscope and it's homogenous down to, to 41,000. I figured out by accident how to put this stuff all together. Then I hired Dr. Reichert down at Boise State to do all the biological research for me in Petri dishes. That cost me a little. But he came back to me and he said, you know what's interesting about your product? And I said, what? And he said, this stimulates microbial activity better than agar does. And he said, the other thing I found out about it is a teaspoon is more than a tablespoon. I said, a teaspoon is more than a tablespoon? He said, I get better biological activity at a teaspoon dilution than I do at a tablespoon. He said, How did, why? I said, I don't know anything about it. All I did is make it. We, so we started making a product. I actually had to make a two liter batch at a time because I had to have my lab pumps and I, I had to inject these things at specific temperatures and specific pHs in order to get it all together. And then I had a guy, I, actually I would, was given this away. My research mostly was with trees, so I nicknamed it Save a Tree. And I had a guy come to me and said, I'd like 50 gallons. I thought, how in the devil am I gonna make 50 gallons of this? I'm only set up to do a two liter batch at a time. But then, and this is a spiritual thing, but once, once you set your mind to something that you're dedicated to, as one great philosopher once said, all things visible and invisible come to your aid. And all of a sudden, a fertilizer facility up in Tri-Cities became available. They had these huge stainless steel tanks right on the Columbia River. And the EPA said, out of here. You're not gonna have a fertilizer plant sitting on the banks of the Columbia River. So we went up and we disassembled it and we put it on, on flatbeds and we brought it down. I had to buy a plot of ground and, put, and, and pour a concrete slab just so we'd have a place to put these tanks because they're so big and their legs would sink in the ground. And that was the start of something that has been my transitional product for agriculture. Because I learned years ago, I can really affect a lot of people's nutrition by helping them grow their gardens, by helping somebody grow an acre. But if I really want to affect this nation and the food, we're gonna to have to affect big ag. And man, that's a tough nut to crack. But we're making headway. Because to Gabe's point, your farm will actually produce better using less input. And once you've made the transition, you don't have to use any inputs at all except for your seed and, and a little bit of common sense. And, and a lot of our big farmers are scared to death that they won't be able to do it without the use of their chemical pesticides. And I can tell you that's nonsense. I can grow cabbages, but the cabbage moth will fly over them. I never have a worm chew on my cabbages. And it used to be, I'd have to get a cabbage up and, and the, the slugs and the, and the earwigs and stuff gobbled it up before I could get to it. You, 
Insects and disease are nature's garbage collectors. They eat what is not fit for us to eat. So when we kill the insects that are trying to eat the crop that we're not supposed to be eating, we're, we're caught in what I call the cycle of death. And when you're dealing with the soil, when you're dealing with agriculture, you've got one of two ways to go, down or up. The soil doesn't stay the same. It's either getting better or it's getting worse. And when you get caught in the cycle of death, that means that you've used enough chemical fertilizer to burn the organics out of your soil so you don't have the microbial life in the soil to make the antibiotics, antibi antibodies and antibiotics to protect the plant from the pathogens in the soil. So you have to use pesticides. You have to use insecticides. You have to use fungicides because we don't have the microbial diversity in the soil that protects the plant. And this is all educational. I mean, we, it's one thing for us to just tell everybody they need to go to regenerative. But how do we teach them actually to do it? That is the challenge. That's what you guys' challenge is. I'm trying to do less, not more right now, but I congratulate you young people for, for getting involved in this and making, making this your life's work because it's, it, it's do or die because we're, we've got enough pesticides going right now, uh, especially with our Roundup Ready crops where they're pouring uh, glyphosate on at such a, a heavy rate that we're, we're actually killing ourselves. And does, is there anybody in this room that does not know of someone that has a chronic degenerative disease, cancer or diabetes or you name it, whatever it is? I'll bet you there's not. If there is one here, I got a $100 bill, I'll give it to you. <laughs> there isn't. There, we're all dying. We're full of pesticides. We don't have adequate nutrition. We don't, and, and by that nutrition, I'm telling you, I think it's primarily trace minerals. Trace minerals is our key factor. And in most cases, our soils have adequate trace minerals, but we don't have the biological diversity to release the minerals to the plant so that the plant can take them in so that they can feed us and our animals adequately. Sorry. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. <laughs> Want to pass that down to Gabe? Gabe, we really appreciate that. And, and that's the point that we're here is to have authentic conversations where you tell us how you really feel. So I, I genuinely appreciate that. Gabe, will you take us home or take us into lunch on just uh, the significance of biology? You know, Jim made many good points there. But the one that I found most interesting was his point of we lack the biology. And one of the things our firm consults on very broad acreages in, we're in 46 states. We have done literally thousands of tests. And one of the tests we run is called a total nutrient digestion test. And we just do one of these on a farm or ranch to show farmers and ranchers. We're on over 32 million acres. Do you know how many tests we've taken that show a deficiency in nutrients? Zero. Every single test we've ever taken, every farm, every ranch, there's plenty of nutrients, but we lack the biology to make those nutrients available. The reason we show that to our clients is to prove to them that they need to change the way they see things. And I tell people, when I was in the old production mindset, I used to wake up every morning trying to decide what I was going to kill that day. Because it was going to be a weed, a pest, a fungal disease, I was going to kill something. Now I wake up every morning, how do I get more life on my farm, on my ranch? And when you realize there's more microorganisms in a teaspoonful of healthy soil than there are people on this planet, that kind of puts things in perspective. Let's work with life instead of against her. Thank you guys very much. Let's give a round of applause for these guys up there.
Okay, we're going to take a, a, a lunch break. Uh, we've got a half hour here. Uh, feel free to mosey around, uh, do what you need to do. I got to thank some sponsors. Uh, Power Knots, we have anaerobic and aerobic uh, digesters in the house. We got uh, Digester Doc, you know, the team over here. We're actually going to, at about 12.30, 12.45, we got two speakers. You know, they're going to be talking um, both very familiar with Idaho and very uh, different perspectives. So um, thank you guys so much for, you know, coming up and, and chatting with us, and we'll be right back shortly. Yeah.